Thank you, thank you, everybody. I'm uh, I'm really excited to be here and to be able to share my ideas and to share my uh, my experience in let's say linking different kind of cultures or linking different kind of ambition towards reality. Um, like I said earlier, I'm an I'm an architect from Holland, uh, and I want to introduce a little bit my background. My background is that I started this office in Amsterdam with these four. Uh, with these three friends from university and the one thing that we shared in common is that we had a dream and like s written here in the in the Dutch newspaper this dream was uh, characterized as uh, next architect is making a boy's dream come true and I hope that after 15 years because this image is uh, years old right now I hope that I'm still living this boy's dream and this boy's dream 15 years ago was very simple this dream was trying to understand the world better, the world we live in, and the world I work in and act in and thinking as an architect. And we were very interested in this issue of globalization or this issue about that we are able to link ideas and places and time and products and, and people uh, much more conveniently uh, in these times than in these times before. And we were interested in what is the backside of linking all these people and all these ideas more quickly and more conveniently. Obviously, there's an advantage, but what is the influence on cities if we increasingly start to develop under this increased linkage or under this increased influence of globalization? So what we did is we wrote a proposal that the four of us, these four young architects, visited these cities which you can see on the world map here in just a time span of four months. And this was 1999, just at the end of the last millennium. And we wanted to take a snapshot of these world metropolises at the end of the millennium in order to be able to compare what the influence of globalization is on the appearances of cities. So what does it mean that, for instance, very simple, McDonald's is available anywhere in any city. So does that have any influence on the way people experience their city, for instance, the way cities look? This was my first trip to China as well. I visited three, uh, three cities in China. And if I would compare the these cities, at least as a young architect uh, experience, to the other cities I visited, the quest or let's say the dialogue between old values or cultural historical values with this, with this ferocious quest for mo uh, modernization, which I think is characteristic for China, was most obviously in Chinese cities. So you have this large 5,000 year culture and history which you somehow need to relate to a, a modernization process in which you need to have these values somehow cooperate with each other, or at least find some surplus value. So this was very intriguing for me as a young architect. This is a part of the result of this project, which you can see here, it's very, very small, which you can see on a horizontal line, you can see the 70 different, or part of the 70 different topics which we, which we photographed, for instance, from skyline to cityscape to mobility to neighborhoods to markets. And vertically, you can see the individual cities. So if I would zoom a little bit bigger, you, for instance, become now very able to compare the different ways cityscapes are developing in cities all around the world. The one result of this project was that obviously these, these cities become more and more exchangeable in the way they look like. CBDs look more or less the same. Train stations look, look more the same. Uh, neighborhoods start to look more and more the same. So it becomes, on the one hand, very convenient for uh, naive traveler, I would say, to just go to these places and visit these places and, you know, be part of these places. What this project did is many, many things, but one of the most important things is that it unlinked us from only being an architect as such. So we started our office and we started suddenly designing things that we never studied or learned to, learned to study at university. So we really started literally starting uh, to design things like lamps, like chairs, like architecture games, and everything in between, all the way up until how we can start to think different about city planning, for instance. This was really liberating. So this, uh, this, this idea of linking all these different cities in the world together in this project and unlinking myself from, from my own profession really liberated my mind, I would say. It also brought me back in 2004 to, to Tsinghua University to share these ideas and share these findings we had from these projects, and especially from this, uh, from this world trip project. And again, this question started popping up, how does, how does it 
work in a, in, a, in a Chinese context to have this quest for modernization and how to relate it back to your own culture uh, and, and, and history. And especially, and I would say even more interesting, what is the position a Western architect can take in this, in this dialogue between these two opposing forces, I would say. This question of what a Western architect could do in, in, this, uh, uh, in this Chinese context became so so seductive that in 2004 we decided as an office to move to China and I moved to Beijing to set up an office here and this is the actual screen in the airplane when I uh, was just about to land and then suddenly I realized that because this traveling all over the world was so convenient and superficially easy to do it meant something completely different if you really wanted to start to work somewhere and this is a very pivotal moment when I saw on the screen the city named Luoyang and I, as a, I would say, well-educated Western architect, never had heard of the city Luoyang before. And I would say that uh, almost nobody in Europe has heard of the city Luoyang. So I started looking up in my guidebook and I discovered that in the, during the Tang Dynasty, already one million people were living in this city. And during the Tang Dynasty, we in Europe, we didn't build even cities at that time. So why should I be able to contribute something to, uh, to a civilization, to a country where there's such an incredible long history already of building cities and of, of, of uh, having people living in city life? This, this question, of course, is very interesting because it triggered me in order to be able to develop something. And it became very, very obvious I needed to develop something is when we started doing our first project, a very small project. Uh, which is, was built in, uh, near Sidan, and it's already demolished now. It's a very small sales center project, and here you can see the image here. It's not so big, it's around 100 square meter. It's only two stories high. And the, the image itself is not so interesting, but the thinking behind at that time really represented what a Western architect tries to do, and how a Western architect tries to position itself uh, when, it, when dealt with Chinese uh, assignment. So, if we look at step number one, this was the maximum volume we could project on this side. I tried to open this box because this building should be inviting, so opening and private at the same time, so it should close, should be somehow more closed. So the dialogue I, would, I was trying to find in this building was being open and closed, being private and being public at the same time. And when this project was built, the client stood next to me and said, well, I liked your project so much, I liked your design so much, because for me it looked like a mouse that was eating gold. And of course I as a Western architect didn't understand anything about a mouse eating gold. It doesn't, didn't associate anything to me. And fortunately my translator next to me told me, oh that's a big compliment because a mouse is a mythical figure and eating gold, well that could represent like gaining wealth. So this building has a very good meaning in itself because when you go there you're a smart person, you're potentially gonna gain a lot of, uh, a lot of wealth. So what I needed to do immediately as a, as a Western architect is try to understand these two aspects better. So this gold and this mouse, I needed to understand them better in order to find some space in the overlap to really contribute something with projects that from my ambition would add some quality to cities or to people's life here. Understanding the mouse is very difficult for a Westerner in China. Because as a, as a Western architect, at least, you need to try to understand everything you cannot understand and probably will never understand, but you have to keep trying. Understanding the gold, on the other hand, is much more easy because the parameters for, for feasibility and for earning on an architectural or an urbanistic project are much more easy and much more universal. So if we would just look at all the numbers which would increase value for a developer, could we see the first movie, please? It's very obviously that there's a relationship between the space you leave on the open ground, for instance, for people, public space or social space or communal space, and the amount of units you project in a certain typology of buildings. So these are, this, well, you could just consider this as a, as a piece of city. So somehow there's a maximum for a developer or for a government to be able to, to gain from a project. So that's one interest, which is obviously very important. Can next movie, please? But if we really would take even more parameters into consideration, like the open space you got in a project, like the, the, the cross floor area, the, the density, so all kind of professional parameters we use in, in, uh, in, in our work, then somehow if we have all the 
potential golden opportunities here. There's a, there's a moment when this mouse starts to relate back to the, to the gold. So somehow in these projects there's quality, and this idea of quality is different in China, I would argue, than it is in my country. So this, this, this dialogue between the mouse and the gold, or if you would say the, the Western culture and the Chinese culture, or history and modernization, I summarized in this book, which I called uh, You Cannot Change China, China Changes You. And this is uh, uh, more or less a description of being five years, my first five years in China, and how to deal as a Western architect with all these different kind of values, and potentially translate them in something which is surplus value, which is, which is quality. This is, uh, it's still going on, it's been published in three uh, languages now, and we're talking about different languages being published now, so this is an ongoing dialogue, it's not a finished book. But this idea of finding this, this surplus value is, is, I think, underlying all our projects we are doing in China right now, and I would, these are, these are uh, just a snapshot of the projects we have been doing and we are doing, and I would just like to introduce three of these projects and to show that sometimes we are able to find a lot of space between the gold and the mouse and sometimes we are able to find only very little space. Sometimes we are able to find little overlap between Western culture and Chinese culture or the interpretation of Western culture and Chinese culture and sometimes we are able to find much more. This is a, a project for a creative design district in the south of Beijing. These are all very, very small startup companies that only have a very, very small unit where they can start their company. And we translated the idea of the, of the Chinese printing blocks, which represent a Chinese character, which represents in itself a whole kind of different story, in, a, in an elevation of an office building, in a startup building. And together, these printing blocks just tell a completely different story. So it's possible if you work in this, in this building and you start up your own company, you can have your own recognizable company within the larger whole of a bigger story. This is, a, this is really a, a golden or a market-driven development, I would say, where we try to, try to do something with our cultural interpretation or with our culture-driven development. And we can only find very little space to do this because there's a lot of economy behind these kind of projects. It's just been realized, and these are some of the interior spaces. So you can see they're very, very small, complex interior spaces, which potentially allow a lot of different kind of use. The second project I would like to show you is uh, something we call Creative Office. So the assignment here was to, de uh, to design an interior for an office building that should be very, very creative. It should uh, allow people to stimulate and have different kind of ideas together. But it was, if you would consider a section of the building, just five segregated departments. People would potentially never interact with each other. And we, as a condition for creativity, figured that people at least should be able to communicate with each other. So what we did is we sacrificed many of the floors and integrated two forum-like stairs there. And suddenly it becomes possible for people from the yellow department to talk with the purple department. So this is, this is what it looks like. So this is the, basically the lobby space. So this is a, a stair and a theater or a forum, everything at once. So sometimes it's empty. It's just inviting people to use it or people use it as a stair. Sometimes you just coincidentally meet somebody here on this stair. You can talk or you can exchange an idea. And sometimes it becomes possible to really have an informal meeting here. This, this project was awarded or was nominated for the Dutch Design Award. And in this struggle for me to unlink myself from my Dutch background in order to be able to understand working in China better, I suddenly got completely linked back to Holland. And the jury just mentioned, yeah, this is so typically Dutch what you did in China. Well, well, I tried to do something which is completely un-Dutch and really tried to do something that would contribute to a Chinese company. I still wasn't able to follow my, uh, or to, to unlink myself completely from my own cultural background. The last project is a, is a bridge in, in, in Changsha, which is now under construction. What we tried to do in this project here is try to add a space, a potentially meaningful space to a city which is not there yet. And the, the client here needed a bridge to connect the top of a mountain with a sports park down uh, below in 200 meters. And what we try to do here is to make a bridge that doesn't have a beginning and doesn't have an end. So it's really like a space in itself where people just could go from one route to another route to another route to another route. So this is like a Möbius ring in Western thinking. And we got totally intrigued by the Chinese association of the, of the lucky nut. 
So this is where we are able to, were able to combine a Western kind of concept, Western kind of thinking, making a space for a city where people don't just go through or move through, but potentially just could meet or could do all kinds of things which we don't plan as architects. And there's this, this extra association of a Chinese knot here. So this is how you can go from one route to the other route. Sometimes you can look over it, sometimes you have a view, sometimes you don't have a view. This is the, this is the, night, the night view. And what this other project just did is linking me back to what you designed for this interior is completely Dutch. So what we, our ambition here was to design something potentially meaningful for a Chinese city. And then suddenly CNN found this project and awarded this project as being one of the most sexy buildings of 2014, which of course wasn't any of the ambitions uh, before as an architect. I would, uh, I pass my time. I would like to, uh, I would like to leave it here. Thank you, thank you very much, and I hope to be able to have a better talk with you.